A wise woman once told me that, quote, in life, there are acts of great faith and acts of great foolishness, and sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between the two. And uh, when I began writing this book, I was told by many that it was an act of great foolishness, uh, yet I clung to the belief that it was an act of faith. I felt I was taking a great leap of faith, that if people of faith and conscience had access to the history, the data, uh, all of the sources and information that I could provide in this book that they too could have the same kind of awakening I finally did. That they too would be able to begin to see the connections between mass incarceration and earlier systems of racial and social control in our country and that people of faith and conscience would, if given the tools and the information, see the necessity for bold and courageous action, for genuine movement building uh, to end mass incarceration. But as I was writing the book, many people, uh, including some of my mentors and colleagues, told me that writing this book was an act of great foolishness. I was told that I was ruining my career and that if I hoped to be taken seriously as a law professor or as an academic, I should stick to writing traditional law review articles and not cast myself as some kind of radical. And I must admit that, you know, that for a while I began to believe that perhaps I was engaged in an act of foolishness. And writing the book was so much more difficult than I had imagined. And so my confidence and my hope and faith began to falter. And I started telling my husband that I was going to give up writing the book. Over and over I would tell him, no, really, seriously, honey, this time I'm, I'm giving up. I'm, I'm, I'm done, for real. And then by no small coincidence, every time I said I was done, I was really quitting it, I was, I was finished with this project, a letter would show up in the mail from a prisoner or a family member who had a loved one who had just been released from prison begging me to finish the book. While I was writing my book, when it was still a work in progress, I had done a number of media interviews uh, about the work and I started receiving letters in the mail from people behind bars uh, and by some small irony, they must have known that I was thinking of giving up the book. One letter began and I quote, you're probably thinking about quitting as I'm sure many people are telling you not to write this book, <laughs> but do it anyway. Do it for those of us who no longer have a voice. I now see that I would have been a fool not to finish. A movement to end, yeah, a, a movement to end mass incarceration is in fact emerging in the United States. And while my book may not have catalyzed this movement, it is becoming an important tool, one that would not have existed if I had not listen to spirit whispering in my ear. And so seeing all of you here tonight fills me with joy. I see now that my prayers and my hopes have truly been answered and that the seeds that I hope to plant right along next to the many other seeds of hope and justice that have been planted by advocates and scholars and family members who are struggling in this era of mass incarceration are beginning to be watered. And soon, I hope and I pray, this movement will come to full bloom and we will see an end to mass incarceration in America. Martin. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. once said there is, quote, nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. And he was talking at that time about a profound moral revolution that was underway, a struggle for the recognition of the dignity and value of all humankind, a struggle to put an end to the old Jim Crow. And shortly before he died, he told an audience the story of Rip Van Winkle, 
uh, who fell asleep for 20 years. Uh, when he began his extended nap, there was a sign posted on the wall of a nearby inn with a picture of King George III emblazoned on it. But when Rip Van Winkle woke up two decades later, the inn had a sign of George Washington on it. And Dr. King told the audience that the most striking fact about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not that he slept for 20 years, but rather that he had slept through a revolution. He said, quote, there are all too many people who, in some great period of social change, failed to achieve the new mental outlooks that the new situation demands. I think his words are as relevant today as they were back then. Many of us, myself included, have slept through a revolution, actually a counter-revolution, a counter-revolution that has blown back much of the progress that Dr. King and so many other freedom fighters gave their lives for. This revolution, this counter-revolution, has occurred with barely a whimper of protest. And yet it has successfully relegated millions of poor people, overwhelmingly people of color, to a permanent second class status, stripping them of the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement. While many of us have been asleep, a vast new system of racial and social control has emerged that would certainly have Dr. King turning in his grave. One day we may look back and wonder how we could have possibly slept for so long. But I thank God that we are finally waking up. Well, I've been asked tonight to share the thesis of my book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, and to a large extent, the title of the book speaks for itself. I argue that today, in the so-called era of colorblindness, and yes, even in the age of Obama, something akin to a caste system is alive and well in America. The mass incarceration of poor people of color is tantamount to a caste-like system, a system that relegates people to a permanent second-class status nearly as effectively as systems of racial and social control we supposedly left behind. It is, in my view, the moral equivalent of Jim Crow. Now, I acknowledge in the introduction to my book that there was a time when I rejected this kind of talk out of hand. There was a time when I resisted strenuously comparisons between mass incarceration and slavery or mass incarceration and Jim Crow, believing that People who made those kinds of claims and comparisons were engaging in exaggerations, distortions, and hyperbole. In fact, I thought people who made those kinds of claims were actually doing more harm than good to efforts to reform our criminal justice system and achieve greater racial equality in the United States. In fact, the first time I encountered the idea that our criminal justice system might be functioning like a caste system, I was rushing to catch the bus in Oakland, California, and this bright orange poster stapled to a telephone pole caught my eye. And on it, it said in large bold print, the drug war is the new Jim Crow. And I remember stopping for a minute and scanning the text of the flyer, and I saw that a small community group was holding a meeting at a local church a few blocks away and they were organizing to protest racial profiling, three strikes law in California, police brutality, the expansion of California's prison system, the drug war, and I remember thinking to myself, yeah, you know, criminal justice system is racist in a lot of ways, but it doesn't help to make such absurd comparisons to Jim Crow. Now, people just think you're crazy. And then I crossed the street, hopped on the bus, headed to my new job as director of the Racial Justice Project for the ACLU in California. <laughs> well, when I began my job at the ACLU, I thought I knew a lot about racial bias in our societal institutions. I had been 
working as a civil rights lawyer for a number of years, representing victims of racial bias, gender bias in employment. We had been suing Fortune 500 companies for gender and race discrimination, companies like Home Depot and public supermarkets in the South, suing them for race and gender discrimination. So I understood well how stereotyping and conscious and unconscious bias can permeate all levels of an organization with truly disastrous consequences. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to take all of the tools that I had developed as a civil rights lawyer uh, fighting employment discrimination, I'm just going to apply those tools, those litigation tools to criminal justice reform and join with others to root out racial bias wherever and whenever it might rear its ugly head in the criminal justice system. But by the time I left the ACLU, I had come to realize that I had been dead wrong about the criminal justice system. It's not just another institution in our society infected with racial bias, but a different beast entirely. The activists who posted that sign on the telephone pole, they weren't crazy nor were the smattering of lawyers and activists around the country that were beginning to connect the dots between mass incarceration and earlier forms of racial and social control. It was only after years of representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement in poor communities of color and attempting to assist people released from prison re-enter into a society that had never shown much use for them in the first place, that I finally had a series of experiences that began what I now call my awakening. I began to awaken to a racial reality that is so obvious to me now that what seems odd in retrospect is that I had managed to be blind to it for so long. As I describe in the introduction to my book, what has changed since the collapse of Jim Crow has less to do with the basic structure of our society than the language we use to justify it. In the era of color blindness, it is no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. So we don't. Rather than rely on race, we use our criminal justice system to label people of color criminals and then engage in all the practices we supposedly left behind. Today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways in which it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Once you're labeled a felon, the old forms of discrimination, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote, exclusion from jury service, suddenly legal. As a criminal, you have scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. Now, if you're like I was more than a decade ago and tempted to believe that these kinds of comparisons and analogies are exaggerations or distortions. Consider this. There are more African American adults under correctional control today, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. As of 2004, more black men have been stripped of the right to vote disenfranchised than in 1870, the year the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting laws that explicitly deny the right to vote on the basis of race. Now, of course, during the Jim Crow era, black folks were kept from the polls by poll taxes and literacy tests. Well, today, felon disenfranchisement laws accomplish what poll taxes and literacy tests ultimately could not. A black child born today has less of a chance of being raised by both parents than a black child born during slavery. 
80% of all African American children can now expect to spend at least a significant part of their childhood years living apart from their fathers. This is due in large part to the mass incarceration of black men. And contrary to the image frequently presented in the media of black men being a bunch of deadbeat dads who don't care about their children, the research shows that black men actually do a better job of maintaining contact with their children following a separation due to imprisonment or divorce or any other factor than men of any other racial or ethnic group. But no other racial or ethnic group faces such an extraordinary challenge in playing the role of a traditional father in our society today. And that's not to say black men couldn't do better, but white men could do better as fathers. Latinos, Asian men could do better as fathers. Black men do a better job at trying than men of any other race. But trying is difficult when you are locked behind bars, when you're jobless or barred by law from residing in the same home as your children and your spouse. Now this phenomenon of black men kept from their families and their children, their loved ones, doesn't affect some small segment of the black community as we know. To the contrary, in major urban areas, more than half of working age African American men have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. In fact, in the Chicago area, if you take into account prisoners, you know, if you actually count them as people, you know, prisoners are typically excluded from unemployment statistics, poverty statistics, thus masking the severity of racial inequality in the United States. But if you count prisoners as people in the Chicago area, nearly 80% of working age African American men have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. It was recently reported in a book just published by Ernest Drucker called A Plague of Prisons that in Washington, D.C., that figure has now surpassed 90%. These men are part of a growing undercast, not class, caste, a group of people defined largely by race, relegated to a permanent second class status by law. Now, I'm fairly certain that there's at least one person out there who's thinking, what is she talking about? Our criminal justice system isn't a system of racial control, it's a system of crime control. And if black folks would just stop running around committing so many crimes, they wouldn't have to worry about being locked up and then stripped of their basic civil and human rights. But therein lies the greatest myth about mass incarceration. Namely, that it's been driven by crime and crime rates. It's not true. It's not true. Over the last 30 years, our prison population has exploded, has quintupled. We've gone from a rate of incarceration, we've gone from about 300,000 people behind bars in the mid-1970s to over 2 million today. We now, as a nation, have the highest rate of incarceration in the world, dwarfing the rates of highly repressive regimes like Russia or China and Iran. But again, this explosion in imprisonment is not due to crime rates. Over the past few decades, crime rates have fluctuated, have gone up, have gone down. Today, as bad as crime rates are in many parts of the country, crime rates are actually at historical lows. But incarceration rates have soared. 
Most criminologists and sociologists today will acknowledge that crime rates and incarceration rates in the United States have moved independently of one another. Incarceration rates, especially black incarceration rates, have soared regardless of whether crime was going up or down in any given community or the nation as a whole. Now people often tell me, well, shouldn't we focus on the front end, on keeping kids in, in schools and fixing our schools so they don't wind up in prison? And my answer is yes, yes, we absolutely must fix our schools and give each child a quality education so they have an opportunity to compete in this new global economy. And if we want to bring down violent crime rates, there's absolutely nothing more important than education and job creation. William Julius Wilson's book, When Work Disappears, he cites data showing that if you control for joblessness, in other words, if you compare white jobless men with black jobless men, the racial disparities in violent crime disappear. Now, joblessness is not an excuse for violence by any means. But if we want to reduce violent crime in our communities, the best remedy is education and job creation. But reducing crime rates Simply reducing crime rates will not end mass incarceration. Let me repeat that. Simply reducing crime rates will not end mass incarceration. Why? Because crime rates have not been driving the explosion of our prison system. So what has? If not crime and crime rates? Well, it turns out that the activists who post that sign on the telephone pole were right. The war on drugs and the get tough movement, the wave of punitiveness that washed over the United States. What has changed dramatically is not so much crime, but what gets defined as crime and how we respond to it. And nothing has contributed more to this harsh response than the war on drugs. Drug convictions alone, just drug convictions, accounted for two-thirds of the increase in the federal prison system and more than half of the increase in the state prison system between 1985 and 2000, the period of our prison system's most dramatic expansion. Drug convictions have increased more than 1,000% since the drug war began. But to get a sense of how large a contribution the war on drugs has made to mass incarceration, consider this. There are more people in prisons and jails today just for drug offenses than were incarcerated for all reasons in 1980. Now, most Americans violate drug laws in their lifetime. Most do. That's what the research shows. But the drug war, not by accident, has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color. Even though studies have consistently shown now for decades that contrary to popular belief, people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites, or sell. Now that defies our basic racial stereotypes about who's a drug dealer. You know, if you picture a drug dealer in your mind, you're probably picturing some black kid standing street corner with his pants sagging. Plenty of drug dealing happens in the hood but it happens everywhere else in America as well. A white kid living in rural Kansas doesn't drive to the hood to get his marijuana or his meth or his cocaine. No, he gets it most likely from someone of his own race down the road. In fact, where significant differences in the survey data appear, it frequently suggests that white youth are more likely to engage in illegal drug dealing than black youth. But that's not what you would guess by taking a peek inside our nation's prisons and jails which are overflowing with black and brown drug offenders. In some states, 80 to 90% of all drug offenders sent to prison have been one race, African American. Now I find that 
Many people, when they see the data, they're stunned and they say, yeah, that's awful. Those racial disparities, it's astounding. But still, we need to be waging a drug war in those ghetto communities because that's where the violent offenders can be found. That's where the drug kingpins can be found. They say it makes sense to wage the drug war in the ghetto communities because we have to get tough with them. That's where the violence is. Indeed, in my experience, most people seem to imagine that the war on drugs was declared in response to the emergence of crack cocaine and the related violence. And for a while, I, I believed that too. But it's not true. It's not the case. President Ronald Reagan declared the current drug war in 1982 at a time when drug crime was on the decline, not on the rise. He declared the drug war before, not after, crack became a media sensation and was ravaging inner city communities. President Richard Nixon was the first to coin the term a war on drugs, but it was President Ronald Reagan who turned that rhetorical war into a literal one. And at the time he declared his drug war, drug crime was actually on the decline and less than 3% of the American population identified drugs as the nation's most pressing concern. So why declare a drug war at a time when drug crime is declining and the American population isn't much concerned about drugs? Well, the answer is that from the outset, the drug war had relatively little to do with genuine concern about drug addiction or drug abuse and nearly everything to do with politics, racial politics. Numerous historians and political scientists have now documented that the war on drugs was part of a grand Republican Party strategy known as the Southern Strategy of using racially coded, get tough appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to poor and working class whites in the South who were resentful of, fearful of, anxious about many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. Now to be fair, I think we have to acknowledge that poor and working class whites really had their world rocked by the civil rights movement. You know, wealthy whites, they could send their kids to private schools, give their kids all of the advantages that wealth has to offer, but poor and working class whites were faced with a social demotion. It was their kids who might be bused across town to go to a school they believed was inferior. It was their kids and themselves who were suddenly forced to compete on equal terms for limited jobs with this whole new group of people they've been taught their whole lives to believe were inferior to them. And then to make matters worse from their perspective, affirmative action programs created the perception that black folks were now leapfrogging over them on their way to Harvard and Yale and fancy jobs in corporate America. And this state of affairs created an enormous amount of fear, resentment, anger, but it also created an enormous political opportunity. Pollsters and political strategists found that thinly veiled promises to get tough on them a group of people not so suddenly defined by race could be enormously successful in persuading poor and working class whites to defect from the Democratic New Deal coalition and join the Republican Party in droves. In fact, in the words of H.R. Haldeman, President Richard Nixon's former chief of staff, he explained the strategy this way, quote, the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to." End quote. Well, they did. A couple years after the drug war was announced, crack cocaine began to ravage inner city communities. And the Reagan administration seized on this development with glee, actually hiring staff whose job it was to feed to the media stories of inner city crack babies and crack deals and the so-called crack whores and crack related violence. 
Their goal was to make crack a media sensation in the hopes that it would bolster public support for a drug war they had already declared and persuade Congress to devote millions more dollars to waging it. And the plan worked like a charm. Almost overnight, our television sets were saturated with images of crack babies, crack dealers, the so-called crack whores. And a wave of punitiveness swept over the United States. And soon Congress was passing harsh mandatory minimums for possession of small amounts of crack cocaine and other drugs, sentences harsher than murderers receive in some other Western democracies. And soon, Democrats began competing with Republicans to prove they could be even tougher on them than their Republican counterparts. And so it was President Bill Clinton who escalated the drug war far beyond what his Republican predecessors even dreamed possible. And it was President Clinton that championed laws denying federal financial aid to drug offenders for college. It was President Clinton who championed laws banning people with criminal convictions from access to public housing so that people wouldn't have housing upon release from prison. It was the Clinton administration that championed laws denying even food stamps under federal law to people who were once caught with drugs. To a large extent, the basic architecture of this new caste system was championed by a Democratic administration desperate to win back the so-called white swing voters, the folks who had defected from the Democratic Party in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement. Still, in my experience, many people who are familiar with this history defend the drug war and mass incarceration nonetheless. They say, but what about all those drug kinpins? And what about the violence in our communities? Don't we need this war to deal with them? And it is true. We need an aggressive approach to dealing with the violence that plagues our communities. But let's be clear, this drug war has never been aimed at rooting out the drug kingpins or the most violent offenders. Never has. never has. Federal funding in this war has flowed to those state and local law enforcement agencies that boost the sheer volume of drug arrests. It's been a numbers game. State and local law enforcement agencies are rewarded in cash by the millions for the sheer numbers of people swept in to the system for drug offenses. This helps to explain why law enforcement so often goes out looking for the so-called low-hanging fruit. Stopping, frisking, searching as many people as possible, pulling as many vehicles as possible over in a search for drugs. But of course they don't do that so much in middle class white neighborhoods. They don't sweep college campuses and universities for drugs, though plenty can be found there, I can assure you. No, these tactics are applied only in poor communities of color because that's where they can get away with it and still get paid. And the results are predictable. People of color have been rounded up in mass for relatively minor nonviolent drug offenses. In 2005, for example, four out of five drug, drug arrests were for simple possession, only one out of five for sales. Most people in state prison for drug offenses have no history of violence or significant selling activity. And in fact, in the 1990s, the Clinton years, the period of the greatest escalation of the drug war, nearly 80% of the increase in drug arrests were for marijuana possession. A drug has now been shown to be less harmful, less addictive than alcohol or tobacco, and at least, if not more prevalent, in middle class white communities and on college campuses as it is in the hood. But by waging the drug war exclusively in the hood, 
We've managed to create a vast new racial undercast in an astonishingly short period of time. Millions of people are now saddled with criminal records and legally denied the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement. Now where has the US Supreme Court been in all of this? Well, the truth is, the US Supreme Court has facilitated the rise of mass incarceration. After the drug war was declared, the Supreme Court eviscerated Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches and seizures. You know, once upon a time, it wasn't legal for the police to just roll up on anybody on the street, stop, interrogate them, frisk them. No, that was considered an unreasonable search and seizure, the very kind of police activity the framers meant to prohibit. But after the drug war was declared, in a series of decisions, the US Supreme Court eviscerated those protections and ruled that as long as the police have consent, they can stop, frisk, search just about anybody, anywhere. Now, what's consent? Consent is when a police officer walks up to a young kid on the street and the officer's got hand on his gun and says, son, put your hands up in the air so I can frisk you and see if you got anything on you. Kid goes, mm-hmm. That's consent. All of the Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches and seizures no longer applies to that encounter. Now the Supreme Court knows that very few people dare to refuse consent when a police officer says, may I search you? May I speak with you for a moment? But even when someone does refuse consent, it'll be their word against a police officers in a court of law. And who is the judge more likely to believe? In this way, the US Supreme Court has granted the police license to sweep communities, stopping, frisking, tossing people, extraordinarily high numbers of folks. Here in New York City, there were 614,000 stops and frisks in 2010. More than 600,000 stops and frisks in one year. 87% were black and Latino. There were 50,000 people arrested for simple marijuana possession. 50,000 people acquired criminal records for having a little weed in their pocket that would have never been found if they were on a college campus or in a middle class white community in a suburban neighborhood. 87% black and Latino. But the US Supreme Court has gone one step further. It has ruled that you can no longer challenge race discrimination by law enforcement. You can no longer challenge racial bias in the criminal justice system unless you have evidence of conscious intentional bias tantamount to an admission. In a series of cases beginning with McCleskey versus Kemp and Armstrong versus the United States, the US Supreme Court ruled it doesn't matter how severe the racial disparities are. It doesn't matter how overwhelming the statistical evidence might be. Unless you can produce some conscious intentional bias like an admission by an officer, you can't even state a claim for racial bias in the criminal justice system today. Well, this may not come as news to you, but most officers do not say, yes, your honor, the reason I stopped him was, well, because he was black. Most prosecutors don't say, well, your honor, I would have given him a better plea deal, but mm, he was black. No, most law enforcement officials, like the rest of us, know better than to state their racial biases out loud. But more importantly, so many of the racial biases and stereotypes that motivate discretionary decision-making by law enforcement operate on such an unconscious level that many law enforcement folks wouldn't even be able to articulate it if they tried. 
you know, an officer who thinks he's doing his job, driving down the street, sees a group of black kids walking down the street with pants sagging a bit, and he thinks, let me jump out, check on, see, see what they're up to, let me frisk them and see, you know. <laughs> Thinking they're doing their job, doing good. The same thought would never cross their mind. See a group of young white kids walking down the street in their neighborhood. That officer may not be meaning any harm to those young black kids walking down the street, but those unconscious biases and stereotypes play out over and over again in hundreds of thousands of stops and frisks every year, adding up to enormous racial disparities in our system, which the Supreme Court has ruled we can't even challenge in a court of law. And in this way, the US Supreme Court has immunized the system of mass incarceration from judicial scrutiny for racial bias, much in the same way that it rallied to the defense of Jim Crow and slavery in their day. Now, I know our time is running short, and I want to leave plenty of time for question and answer, but I just have to identify some of the most obvious parallels between Jim Crow and mass incarceration and say a few words about what we're going to do to end this. You know, Jim Crow was a system of rules, laws, policies, and practices that operated to lock African Americans into a permanent second class status. I have to say that explicitly because I found in speaking to high school students, many of them don't know that. They don't even know what Jim Crow is. They say, new Jim Crow, what's Jim Crow? And with such extraordinary dropout rates today, realize there is a lot of education about our history that needs to happen before we can ever have a conversation about the new Jim Crow. But today, you take some, uh, look at some of the rules and laws that apply to people branded criminals and felons today, and ask yourself if they remind you of a bygone era. The first and most obvious, of course, is denial of the right to vote. 48 states in the District of Columbia deny prisoners the right to vote. And here in the United States, I find people to kind of meet that with a shrug of their shoulders. We're like, well, yeah, they're prisoners. Why should they be able to vote? Well, in many other Western democracies, prisoners have the right to vote. In fact, in some of them, there's voting drives in prison. But here in the United States, we not only deny the vote to people who are in prison, but we strip them of the right to vote in many states for a period of years or sometimes for the rest of their lives. Nationwide, nearly one in seven black men are either temporarily or permanently disenfranchised as a result of felon disenfranchisement laws. Then there's exclusion from jury service. One hallmark of the old Jim Crow was the systematic exclusion of blacks from juries. Well, today, those labeled felons are deemed ineligible for jury service for the rest of their lives. In many areas, all white juries are having a roaring comeback because so many African Americans are deemed ineligible for jury service. Employment discrimination. Virtually every job application has that box you gotta check asking the dreaded question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Doesn't matter if that felony happened a few months ago or 45 years ago for the rest of your life, gotta check that box. Knowing full well the odds are sky high, your application's going straight to the trash. Hundreds of professional licenses are off limits to people who've been labeled felons. In fact, in my state in Ohio, you can't even get a license to be a barber if you've been convicted of a felony. Housing discrimination is perfectly legal, absolutely routine. Public housing projects, as well as private landlords, free to discriminate on the basis of criminal records. In fact, if a young man is released from prison and wants to return home to his children, his partner, and they live in public housing, his whole family risks eviction if they allow him to come home and the family to be reunified again. Discrimination in public benefits perfectly legal. As I mentioned, if you're a drug felon, you're deemed ineligible for food stamps under federal law for the rest of your life. Fortunately, many states have now opted out of the federal ban on food stamps for drug offenders. But still, thousands of people can't even get food because they were once caught with some drugs. So what are people, what are people supposed to do for returning home from prison? <laughs> 
can't get a job, nowhere to sleep, you may not even be able to get food stamps to feed yourself. Well, apparently what we expect them to do is to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, which continues to accrue while you're in prison. And a growing number of states you're expected to pay back the cost of your imprisonment. And then get this. If you're actually one of the lucky few who manages to get a job, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished. 100 to pay back all those fees, fines, court costs, and accumulated back child support. What are folks expected to do? I say, what is this system designed to do? It sure seems designed to send folks right back to prison, which is what in fact happens. That's exactly what happens about 70% of the time. About 70% of people released from prison return within three years, and the majority of those who return, according to some studies, do so in a matter of months because the challenges associated with mere survival on the outside are so immense. Still, many people returning home from prison tell me that's not even the worst of it. It's not even the worst of it. It's the shame and stigma that follows you for the rest of your life that haunts you. It's not just the denial of the job, but that look that flashes over the employer's face when he sees, oh, mm, that box has been checked. It's not just the denial of housing, but the shame of having to beg your aunt or your grandma to sleep in their basement at night. There's nowhere else to take you in. It's that shame and stigma that causes so many people, branded criminals and felons, to try to pass. You know, during the old Jim Crow, light-skinned blacks would try to pass as white to avoid the shame and stigma of race. Well, today, people, branded criminals and felons, try to pass by failing to check the box on employment applications or on housing forms. But more importantly, by lying and denying and avoiding with family members, friends, relatives. There's an excellent ethnographic study conducted in Washington, D.C. It was published as a book called Doing Time on the Outside. It was a study of neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. hardest hit by mass incarceration. I mean, these are neighborhoods where literally every house or every other apartment has a family member who's either behind bars or has just been released from prison. I mean, neighborhoods where incarceration is so common, you'd think people would just be talking about it all the time. Who's in? Who's out? And to some extent, that was true. But in this study, they were unable to find one person, one, who had fully come out to their friends, neighbors, loved ones about their own criminal history or that of their relatives. Children, when asked by a relative, honey, where's your daddy? Where's your daddy been? Child would say, mm, my daddy, mm, I, I don't know where my daddy is. No one full well. Daddy's in prison. People run into a neighbor on the street. Neighbor says, oh, I haven't seen you in years. Where have you been? It's been so long. It's so good to see you. How you doing? Where have you been? Oh, you know, um, I've been out of town. It's good to see you. Um, yeah, I got to go. That shame and stigma keeps even the community's hardest hit silent in denial avoiding, shaming, and blaming one another. And this silence and denial makes collective political action next to impossible. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? Well, I spend the last chapter of my book discussing this in some depth, but one thing is clear, I think. Those of us in the civil rights community We've allowed a human rights nightmare to occur on our watch. We have. We have. While many of us, myself included, fighting for affirmative action, fighting to cling to the gains of the past, millions of people rounded up, branded criminals and felons, stripped of the very rights people gave their lives for. So what do we do? 
Over the last few decades, one trillion dollars has been spent waging the drug war. A trillion with a T. Funds that it could have been used for education in our communities, for job creation. Funds that could have been used for our collective well-being. Instead, those dollars have been used for the destruction of so many of our families, our communities, our dreams. What do we do? My own view is that nothing short of a major social movement has any hope of ending mass incarceration in America. Any hope. And if you think something less will do, if you think piecemeal policy reform is enough, or if you think we can tinker with this machine and then get it right, consider this. If we were to return to the rates of incarceration we had in the 1970s, before the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement kicked off, we would have to release four out of five people who are in prison today. Four out of five. More than a million people employed by the criminal justice system would lose their jobs. Private prison companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange would be forced to watch their profits vanish. This system is now so deeply rooted in our political, economic structure that it isn't just going to fade away. It's not going to just fade away without a major social upheaval, a fairly radical shift in our public consciousness. So, so how do we do this? How do we build this movement? Well, first, I think we've got to begin by telling the truth, the whole truth. We've got to be willing to admit out loud that we as a nation have managed to rebirth a caste-like system in the United States. And we've got to be willing to tell this truth in our churches, in our schools, in our community centers. Because if we fail to wake up, really wake up, we will never build the kind of movement that is necessary to end this system. But even that is not enough. Consciousness raising is not enough. We've also got to be willing to build an underground railroad for the people returning home from prison. Yes. People, people who are struggling, striving to make a true break for freedom have got to be supported, have got to be welcomed with open arms, with love. So many people who have been released from prison tell me often that church is one place they don't feel safe to go. It's a place where they often feel intense shame and stigma. Mothers of sons who are behind bars say, well, I used to go to church, but I don't go anymore. I feel shame now. I know, I know what people must be thinking of me, that I've failed as a mother somehow, that I, I've done wrong. We have got to end the shame and stigma associated with this system and those who've been branded criminals and felons. And how do we do that? Well, first, I think it starts by us admitting our own criminality out loud. Our own. Because the truth is, we're all criminals. We all are. All of us. You know, people tell me I'm not a criminal. Don't call me a criminal. I'm not a criminal. I say, well, maybe you drank underage. Maybe you experimented with drugs, or if the worst thing you've done in your unadventurous life is speed 10 miles over the speed limit on the freeway, you've put yourself and others at more risk of harm than someone smoking marijuana in the privacy of their living room. So, you know, but here in the United States, there are people doing life sentences for first-time drug offenses. Life sentences. The US Supreme Court upheld life sentences for first-time drug offenses in a case called Harmland versus Michigan. They upheld it against a challenge that such a punishment was cruel and unusual in violation of the Eighth Amendment. And the US Supreme Court said, no, it's not cruel and unusual to sentence a young man to death behind bars for a first-time drug offense, even though no other country in the world does such a thing. So we've got to stop this us versus them. The criminals are someone who's not us. And instead say, there but for the grace of God go I. 
all of us. All of us are sinners. All of us have made mistakes, have done wrong. And all of us need to be given second and third and fourth chances, because none of us have made only one mistake in our lives. So we have to open our hearts. But even that is not enough, because just as during the days of slavery, there were some who were doing the work of shuttling a few to freedom through the Underground Railroad, there were also those who were working for the abolition of slavery. And so we must support those returning home and the families who are struggling to survive in the era of mass incarceration, but we've also got to be willing to work for an end to this system itself. And that means ending the war on drugs once and for all. It means abolishing all of these laws that authorize legal discrimination against people in employment, housing, access to public benefits, denying them basic human rights to work and to shelter and to food. And last but not least, we've got to shift from a purely punitive approach to dealing with violence in our community to a rehabilitative and a restorative <laughs> approach to dealing with violence and violent offenders. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to end mandatory minimum sentences and stop and frisk practices and federal funding for the sheer numbers of drug arrests. We've got a lot of work to do. And you might think it's too much, that we can't do it all. And if it feels too overwhelming, just keep this in mind. All of these rules, laws, policies, and practices and tactics rest on one core belief. And it's the same core belief that sustained Jim Crow. It's the belief that some of us are not worthy of genuine care, compassion, and concern. And when we effectively challenge that core belief, this whole system begins to fall like dominoes. A multiracial, a multiracial, multi-ethnic human rights movement must be born. A movement that respects and honors the dignity and humanity of all people. And this has got to be a multiracial movement, a multi-ethnic movement, because although this war on drugs was born with black folks in mind, it is a war that has destroyed the lives of people and communities of all colors. And the same divisive, Racial politics that birth mass incarceration, you may have noticed, is now being played out with immigrants as the target. And a prison building boom aimed at housing suspected illegal immigrants is now underway in the United States. So we've got to connect the dots and build a multiracial movement, multi-ethnic movement on behalf of all of us. But before this movement can even get underway, a great awakening is required. We've got to awaken from this colorblind slumber that we've been in to the realities of race in America. And we've got to be willing to embrace those labeled criminals. Not necessarily all their behavior, but them, their humanness. For it has been the refusal and failure to recognize the dignity and humanity of all people that has been the sturdy foundation for every caste system that has ever existed in the United States or anywhere else in the world. It's our task, I firmly believe, to end not just mass incarceration, but to end this history and cycle of caste in America. Thank you so much for having me tonight.